Welcome to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble, powered by Concierge Resource Professional Consultants. Courageous Conversations is a diversity, equality, and inclusion initiative. It's a gracious space for meaningful discussions about culture, life, business, work, learn, live, worship, and play. It's an audio encyclopedia designed to bridge cultures and generational gaps through active listening and action-oriented changes towards liberation for all. Are you looking for brand exposure? Join our sponsorship network for amazing benefits and perks. It's brand awareness at its best. Do you have a new product, service, or event that you want to promote? Email us at info at crpcnow.com. Courageous Conversations with Teresa Gamble. The radio show, this is our preview premiere for our radio show. (laughs) On Mixed Talk Radio based out of Houston, Texas. We come on Wednesdays at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time and 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So make sure you download the app. Okay. So today we have an amazing storytelling guest, Adonica Toller. She's an African-American historian, a native of Jacksonville, Florida. And it's just befitting because this week is coming up to May Day in Florida. And May Day is on May 20th, this coming Thursday, when the state of Florida was liberated from slavery. So we're going to talk to the expert queen historian (laughs) about May Day on Florida's liberation from slavery and how it kind of it ties in along with Juneteenth that everybody is so familiar with. So I would like to welcome uh, Donica Toller as our special guest today. So, Ms. Tola, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do before we get into May Day. Um, Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be a part of your show. Um, And so I'm just going to tell people we actually went to high school together, graduated (laughs) the same year, and went our separate ways, our same path. We have kind of saw each other here and there. And how we connected is your husband saw me give some black history fact that he was surprised. He had no idea. And um, so you were like, Oh, that's a Donica. So then you say, you know what? I need to, um, I need to connect with her. And so thank you for that. Thank you uh, for thinking that it was even worth your time to reach out to me so we can talk about um, the rich African-American history that's here in Jacksonville. And I did grow up here and um, Teresa and I both can attest that the history that I share every day is not taught in our schools. Um, Even what I'm about to share with you today, people are not aware of it as they should be. People are more familiar with Juneteenth because I would say the Texans did a great job of marketing that and celebrating that. But for Florida, um, the this Liberation Day was May 20th um, in the city of Tallahassee. And there is record of um, former slaves and uh, free blacks celebrating that emancipation from the first day that it was initially officially freed by Brigadier General McCook of the Union Army. Um, So um, thank you for this opportunity. I've loved history all my life. Uh, Even as a little girl, I loved history. I loved sitting at my grandparents' feet, listening to them talk about their lives. And I always had questions and I was always inquisitive about it. And so it um, history was always easy for me in school. I always got A's. I can always remember the dates and times. And so I am very blessed to be working at the largest African-American museum in the state of Florida. I am the museum administrator. We focused primarily on African-American history in Northeast Florida, but the history here is so rich and in-depth that it covers international history as well. 
And so from James Well and Johnson and the song Lift Every Voice and Sing being first sung here in Jacksonville from people like Eartha White, A.L. Lewis, um, the founding of American Beach, one of the few remaining black beaches that still exist today, um, has roots here in Jacksonville. So I'm very blessed to be in the opportunity to share with people every day the rich legacy that's here um, in Jacksonville, Florida. That is amazing. See, I told you, everyone, <laughs> this lady here, she knows the stuff. We've been having a conversation since March. And I have learned so much that I didn't know, even being a native in Jacksonville. So, Adonica, I am so uh, enthused that you are here today. So I understand you mentioned a little bit about May Day. And what I love about you, you have the receipts to back up your <laughs> historical stories. This is not something that was made up. So let's get, let's get into a little bit more about May Day and um, what happened on May 20th, 1865 in Tallahassee, Florida. All right. So initially, we need to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay. Um, there are some misconceived ideas about that document. Um, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free all the slaves. It actually applied to the Southern states that were still a part of the Confederacy. So if there was a Southern state that now was in control of the Union, um, the freedom of slaves in the North and in the Union were not applied to this document. So mm. uh, President Lincoln did not free the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1963. However, once um, the uh, General Lee uh, surrendered to General Grant, the North, the Union started to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation into the states now, in the former states of the Confederacy that are now returning to the Union. So um, each state has a different date. So um, even for Georgia, it's April 8th or 15th, something like that. Mississippi, it's May 8th. Um, Florida, May 20th, um, et cetera. So Juneteenth, um, what we know in Texas, um, uh, June 19th is when General McCook, after he left Tallahassee, he went to Texas to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation. And you also need to know that there were still slaves after this June 19th, 1865. Um, mm -hmm. I believe Delaware and Maine still had slaves. They were still considered slaves. They were not freed. And only seven of the 11 um, Confederate states um, officially ratified the Emancipation Proclamation. So there were still slaves after 1865. So that is not what we have learned in school. It is much deeper than that, much more complicated um, in, in, in execution. And the interesting thing, um, also um, the ratification of the 13th Amendment, where it freed slaves. Well, that's a uh, that's an iffy thing, too, because part of that was as long as they weren't arrested, a, a former slave or a black person was arrested. See, a black person could be arrested afterward and be put in jail, which is another form of slavery. And doesn't that kind of sound familiar for what's happening today mm -hmm. um, in the incarceration, the um, large amount of uh, ex the percentage of larger number of blacks being in jail compared to other groups of people. So it was in the council. So go back everyone and read the 13th amendment and you will see that they were free as long as they did get arrested, which could be very easy. It could be word of just a white person saying you did something to be arrested. And then you could be sent out to go work on a plantation or go work for someone as a slave. So we just need to have a, a total, a better understanding of what the Emancipation Proclamation means and how it was applied and then how it was twisted and changed to really put us back into um, how sharecropping ties into that and how in many cases, um, many blacks were 
put back in slavery, just in a different format. So there's always those good, there's great stories of those who managed to stay out of that, but we also have to be able to, I want you to have a clearer picture that Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves here in the United States as a totality is the image that we have and that's incorrect. Wow, it's amazing how the Emancipation Proclamation was staggered. It kind of reminds me of what's going on with the from the social injustice from last year. How certain states have, you know, changed their policing practice pattern and practices, and some states have not. And it's like it's gradually matriculating and changing. So it's you know, and then when you mention the Thirteenth Amendment about you know we was the slaves were free as long as they didn't get arrested so it's like history is repeating itself or certain um classes of people are trying to keep that type of history relevant mm -hmm. so with i'm glad you encouraging everyone to research and understand the 13th amendment and that's why it's important we need to know all our amendments and you know support our legislators who are trying to either renew or upgrade them to grant us more protections. So with the Emancipation Proclamation, and that was on a, a national level, supposedly. Right. What was it like here in Florida? <sighs> well, the, one of the interesting things about when you ought to talk about freedom of slaves being free once slaves understood that there was the Union Army in their territory, some of them would just walk off. That's how you had the encampments of um, uh, that you see when you hear about. Um, if you ever look at Kinsburn's story about the Civil War and, and Sherman, and you know, as and uh, what people also need to know, there were many several Union um, generals uh, who really believed in freeing the slaves. Um, General Sherman, it actually a conversation he had with black leaders about what, what would the new slaves need to move forward. And he actually had conversation with some um, ministers and other black leaders who had always been working on trying to end slavery. Um, he had a conversation with them. And that's where the concept of 40 acres and a mule came about. Wow. So you have to really, that, that, you know, Sherman had, Sherman was like, everything we're going to give it. I mean, he just was really, <laughs> he was really rabid about it. He was really sincere and um, inter really interested in seeing that the slaves, former slaves received um, land and property. Um, and because one of the reasons why the, and I didn't make this clear, I want to make this clear with the 13th Amendment, why it was dangerous for former slaves. If you could not prove that you had a job, you would be arrested just for that. Oh, and wow. so therefore you would go to jail. And so then they're going to put you to work. But now you're going to be going back into slavery or some kind of enslavement or some kind of um, even if you were a sharecropper, you know, and you buy supplies and you buy it from the owner and now you got a tab that you can't pay off. And so it was a vicious cycle. So I wanted, uh, so you have to, the whole process of the emancipation com coming along, proclamation coming along. You have to understand too, that President Lincoln was gonna do anything he felt was gonna keep the union together. So if freeing the slaves was gonna keep the union together, he was gonna do it. If it wasn't gonna, then he wasn't gonna do it. Then, so it was whatever he thought was going to make the Union United States come back together as a union. So I don't know, I think there was a part of him that wanted it to happen, but overall it was more important that the union came back together than actually freeing the slaves. So, you, but he, there were generals and there were um, abolitionists who have been working throughout the whole process um, having conversations with him about writing that document to free the slaves. And so when you had someone like General Sherman and you had General um, Brigadier General McCook um, going in to enforce it, um, they had in their mindset, they, there were some generals who really did want to see the slaves, slaves free and to enjoy their lives as free Americans. And so um, 
once General Lee surrendered to General Grant, then it was time to enforce it. And so that was the process. So what happened here, that was very interesting because we had a combination of the activists and, and those who knew what was going on, who ran away, who escaped. And um, the state of Florida has a legacy of liberation and and slaves running away. So we're talking about the Seminole Indians and we're talking about even how the Spanish territory, even though there was slavery here, it was a little more lenient. You, Even though it, it was harsh in some cases, you could buy your freedom, you could marry, you could own property, that's interesting, you could own property as a slave. You could sue your slave owner. So this whole area is really unique in how slavery operated in this state. Um, and it was by design because the Spanish didn't like the French or the English. So if you were a slave from Georgia or North Carolina and you made it to Florida, um, then you were safe. They were not going to allow anyone, no slave catcher to come get you and they weren't sending you back. And if you were a male, they were going to give you a gun, make you part of their militia. So one of the scariest things for a slave owner is for a slave to have a gun or to be violent. And so that whole, that was kind of uh, um, permeating here as well. And so once um, General McCook re re arrived in Tallahassee, he originally arrived on the 10th of May to say, okay, I'm here to get things in order and once things were officially in order, the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation was read officially at the home of now um, the Knott House, Luella Knott House. At the time, it was the Wagner House, but Luella Knott and her husband took possession of the house. And every year since uh, 1865, the Emancipation Proclamation is read at the Luella Knott House every year. So if you're in the Tallahassee area, and this year because they're doing it virtually, you can tap in and watch it if you like. I've been to it a couple of times. One year, one of the speakers was a um, Frederick Douglass impersonator. It was fantastic. And the city of Tallahassee goes all out for it. The all downtown, rather, the capital is blocked off and people are walking around. There's food, there's music, there's... Um, uh, 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 black soldier interpreters walking around. There's people walking around in old garments. It's a, it's a, they go all out. And so it's a big celebration every year. But because of the pandemic now, mostly things are um, virtual. But you can go to the cemetery and put wreaths. I think they put roses. They put roses on the on the graves of you Black Union soldiers, and uh, it's a wonderful ceremony. I've done that too, and so that has happened every year. There has been a celebration every year since 1865, and you can find newspaper articles about um, May Day celebrations across the state of Florida. So um, it. Unfortunately, we have lost connection with that um, here in the state and, you know, across the country. Um, June, there has been efforts to make Juneteenth a national holiday. There have been uh, counties within the state who actually have done that. And the, the historians from Florida have been speaking up very loudly and saying, no, you can't. We should not do that because May 20th is for Florida. Uh, we can celebrate what happened with Juneteenth, but Florida is May 20th. And so um, there's actually effort here in the state at diff and different counties have approved that Juneteenth is a paid holiday. Mm. Um, so, and so there's others who say not Juneteenth, not to switch it to May 20th. So there's some who haven't done it. They've switched it and it's going to be May 20th, and those who've already done the Juneteenth, um, I'm not sure if they're going to do a retraction or anything, but that effort has been very popular here in the state to make Juneteenth um, a holiday. So we historians here in Florida have been saying we have to tell the story correctly, and so um, that's what's been happening here in Florida. But you can look across, uh, across the state 
there's these wonderful May Day stories. My grandmother talked about May Day. Even when I was a little girl, there was still some May Day talk and you wear something white and you all, you know, and you go out and you just enjoy the day. There's some picnics. There's um, people and family getting together. Um, but um, and even this year, I was so surprised with um, and happy with one of my friends. She did a May Day at one of our um, city parks. But the May Day was about come out here, bring your hula hoop, bring your whatever, and let's enjoy the day. Let's let's just enjoy our life. Let's enjoy the beautiful park. Uh, let's put the work aside and let's just enjoy life. And so um, that was really great that she did that. She made that effort, and it turned out to be a really great day. Um, but officially, here in Jacksonville, there will be a formal. May Day, uh, May Day celebration, May 20th, here in our Janeswell and Johnson Park. Um, City Council on Jacoby Pittman um, um, submitted a legislation that was approved, and there will be activities all day in the park. Um, I believe they're starting around 12 to 8 o'clock. There's going to be things in the park. And what's really uh, historically when that Emancipation Proclamation was read here, um, Clara White, uh, Eartha White's mother, and a group of other individuals um, would um, have celebration and go to Old City Cemetery and lay wreaths on the graves of the Confederate and Union soldiers to honor them. Um, there was a group called the Lincoln Douglas um, Association, Commemorative Association. Um, as you know, Lincoln and Doug, Frederick Douglas and um, um, Abraham Lincoln's birthday are in the same week. And so they, and they did work together. They were colleagues, they were friends. So you will see there's a lot of organizations named after them and they use that to honor the black soldiers and the emancipation of slaves, a real ceremony that happened a, for years. Once Clara died, Eartha White kind of took it over. Um, actually I was puttering around today and I came across another um, emancipation program. Oh, in fact, I was, and this one was in 1945, um, and these some really prominent leaders in our city were a part of it. Um, Joe H. James, attorney Daniel Webster Perkins. Those of you who don't know Mr. Perkins, he is a he was a civil rights lawyer, and as early as 1912 in the state of Florida, African Americans could serve on juries because of Attorney Perkins. Wow. So that's just the kind of people that are part of this. And Eartha White was um, one, of the, uh, one of the vice presidents uh, of the organization. So it was still happening. Um, and again, um, there's a church, Second Missionary Baptist Church across the street from us that actually has a young person come and recite the Emancipation Proclamation. And he's all in the tuxedo and, he's, and he, he orates the Emancipation Proclamation to a, a listening crowd. And that's another tradition that actually Eartha White started and kept going even, um, even after, so it's still going, even though she's been dead since 1974, that's still happening. So um, to have a, a way of celebrating every year, um, every year in some form, always honoring the soldiers, um, and just having a time to reflect. Um, and every year they also sing, lift their voice and sing in these programs. And so it's just, um, you can see that the African-Americans showed their appreciation and gratefulness that a slavery had ended, but these also the same individuals who were still working to continue to make sure that African-Americans um, did not lose their rights as citizens as well. So, oh my God, you have, you just expounded so much, but I have a question to help our viewers and our listeners out. Who is Clara White and Eartha M. White? Because a lot of people may or may not know. That's okay. my first question. Okay. And then my second question would be is, why is it important that this history needs to still remain relevant? Not for us to go back to live there, but how mm -hmm. is the pedestal or the foundation moving forward? Okay, so so when you want to talk about two dynamic women, <laughs> this here's two of them. <laughs> 
and um, and the things here in the city of Jacksonville and the state, Eartha White, I mean, nationally, I mean, she, Eartha White was the advisor to presidents from, um, um, from the Spanish American War until her death in 1974 to President Nixon. She was a regular visitor and advisor to presidents all that time. So Clara actually was a slave. Uh, born on the Harrison Plantation here in this area in Florida, the Amelia Island area. And another information that people don't know, Amelia Island was primarily African-American and former slaves that lived there and their families. Um, their families are still there for the most part, um, but as things have happened over the years, gentrification and um, urban removal and things are happening, but there are families still there. So Clara was one of those endeared um, slaves. You know, people just loved her. Uh, slave owners loved her. Um, she just had, it was just something about her personality. And she, she had a way of loving on people and taking care of people that wasn't a slave, uh, the mentality of we think of a poor slave, she was this strong woman that everybody just respected. And she actually married one of the colored soldiers from the South Carolina 30, 20, um, 33rd troops, um, Lafayette White. Um, her her uh, maiden name is English, uh, Clara, Clara English White. She married him um, and um, if you also know the story of Susie King Taylor, who was the first black nurse of the Civil War. She also taught many of the former slaves how to read and write while they were in camp. And they were encamped here in this area. Um, the Union had control of Jacksonville twice and the Confederacy had control of the um, Jacksonville twice. Mm -hmm. But Susie King Taylor was in this area and Lafayette, South Carolina troops, uh, colored troops, 33rd South Carolina, 33rd South Carolina colored troops were in Jacksonville area. I'm not sure how he met Clara, um, but more than likely she was probably helping out with slaves coming in, nursing them, um, knowing her personality, and they got married. Eartha came along. There's this wonderful mythical story about Eartha's birth. Um, that she actually was a she actually was adopted by Clara. Um, Clara's I mean Eartha's father actually was a, a prominent white man, and her mother was black. And the story is that you know to keep it hush hush, and um, of course a woman having a baby out of marriage at that time, and they knew Clara, and so they gave her to Eartha. I mean gave Eartha to her, and Eartha grew up in the home of a woman who said service is the space, is the service, the price you pay for the uh, space you occupy. So service is key to your success. That was something that Clara preached to Eartha all her life. Um, but as she lived by that, um, she often fed people out of her home. You know, even though she wasn't that wealthy, she found a way to clothe people, to feed people. She was, um, one of the early stewards on the shipping lines after slavery. And she was in New York a lot, coming back, going up and down the coast, again, serving. Um, and she taught Eartha White about, about service, the Black community, not teaching that and passing that story down. Um, so it's on us. I mean, we complain about, oh, they ain't let, well, we got to stop saying they're not letting because who is going to stop you from telling your child about your family's history um, and the and the heritage that he comes from. And the idea that African Americans have not contributed to this country. One of the things that I say to students when I give them a tour, and there was this period here in Jacksonville where it was quite, you know, people were challenging that there is no culture. What culture they got? Well, I started telling people in my tours, children and adults, I said, well, since African-Americans have not contributed to this country, you need to stop using the traffic light. You need to stop driving your car. You need to stop using your cell phone. You need to stop wearing your shoes. You need to stop going to D.C. It was laid out by a black man. Any southern state, any 
You can't go to the White House because the slaves built that. Any southern capital, the slaves built those capital buildings. Um, you need that. You sh you need to stop listening to jazz and blues. You don't eat rice. Don't eat peanut butter. Don't eat gumbo. What are you talking about? This country would not be what it is without African Americans. And then, of course, you know, railroad train, all that stuff. We would not be this country without that. So, you know, wow. we have to not just argue with people about it. We just have to give them the facts. And if they still don't like it, I mean. There's no reason for you to get upset. It's the truth. You've been listening to Courageous Conversations with Teresa W. Gamble. Courageous Conversations is powered by Concierge Resource Professional Consultants. Would you like to be a guest and have your stories, lessons, and best practices be captured in our audio encyclopedia? We're currently reviewing applications for future guests to join us, and we're especially interested in creating space for long-standing or multi-generational Black-owned businesses. For more information and to be considered, please email info at crpcnow.com to request an application. And remember, do not get weary in well-doing. You shall reap if you faint not. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9.